It's Valentine's Day. Not that you care. You're only 12. And there are more important things to do than worry about girls. Like fixing up this old motorbike with your cousin Eric. Looking up from your work for a moment, you notice smoke rising up from the grass on the other side of your grandmother's backyard. The first thing you think of is, maybe someone threw a match over there, and now it's caught fire to the grass. You go over to investigate, but when you reach the patch of grass, you realize there's nothing there. The grass isn't even on fire. Smoke just seems to be coming out of the ground somehow. If that wasn't confusing enough, it feels like the ground you're standing on is kind of sagging. Then, all of a sudden, the earth opens up below your feet and you fall in, buried up to your knees, then your waist, and then your neck. But before you are consumed completely, your hands catch hold of some roots, halting your descent. You can't see your cousin anymore or anything outside of this pit. There's smoke everywhere and it's unbelievably hot. You hear some sort of howling coming from the abyss below. You scream out for Eric as hellfire licks hungrily at the tips of your shoes. It was 1962, and Centralia, Pennsylvania was a thriving mining town. Children ran around, stopping by the shops, waving to the friendly neighbors who sat on their decks. Nobody felt the need to lock their doors in this safe town. Crime was low, and the community was lively. The residents looked forward to the summertime block parties, a pint at the local saloon, a day at the hair salon, a morning gathering at the church. But this would soon change. At first, locals noticed the eerie presence of fog emerging from the ground, making the whole town feel like the set of a horror movie. In fact, children from neighboring towns and communities would flock to Centralia during Halloween for the spooky ambiance. But then, an almost sulfuric smell started to emanate from the fog, moving into homeowners' basements. November 1979. 17 years after the fog first appeared in town, resident and gas station owner John Coddington began noticing steam coming up from the building beside his business. John's concern only grew a couple of weeks later, when the steam moved to his basement floor. It was scorching to the touch, and John could only think about what would happen if the gasoline tanks he had underground overheated. He called up the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources, and they confirmed his suspicions. The basement floor was reaching 136 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature of the tanks was only rising. To prevent an explosion, John was ordered by the Pennsylvania State Police Fire Marshal to drain the tanks and fill them with water. Unfortunately, this meant his business needed to be shut down and his family relocated. Just as the remaining residents of Centralia were unafraid to ask each other for help as their government abandoned them, so should we when we become overburdened with the weights of life. A 2020 study found that almost 50% of people view going to a licensed therapist like those of today's sponsor, BetterHelp, as a sign of weakness. Isn't that strange? No one would view someone as weak for learning proper form from a personal trainer to avoid injuries at the gym. Why then should learning from a therapist the proper techniques for dealing with stress in the emotional gym of life be any different? Another big reason why people often don't go to therapy is because it gets expensive. A 2022 survey reported that a third of patients have canceled therapy sessions to save money due to the rising cost of living, citing not only the cost of sessions themselves, but even the money spent on transport. BetterHelp's video and phone sessions cut out transportation entirely and are more affordable than other therapy services without cutting the quality of help. When you sign up with BetterHelp, you get matched with your own licensed therapist, specializing in the support you need most, all on your schedule. You can also log into your account at any time to message your therapist and receive timely and thoughtful responses. Join over 4 million people taking charge of their mental health with the support of a licensed therapist by going to betterhelp.com brew. And when you join now through our link, betterhelp.com brew, you'll get a special discount on your first month. Now, let's get back into the small town, seemingly being swallowed up by hell itself. The alarm really began to sound when the cases of lethal drowsiness hit. Colleen Dwanzik recalled a time when her father was watching TV. He was feeling drowsy when all of a sudden he collapsed. His family bolted to his side, attempting to wake him up before rushing to the hospital. Had it been a moment longer, he wouldn't have made it. And this wasn't an isolated incident, yet it didn't cause enough of a stir for any action to be taken. Instead, a temporary solution was implemented where carbon monoxide detectors were installed in homes, but there weren't enough for everyone. Neighbors had to take turns using the detectors during a time when they would ring almost daily. Even worse were the sinkholes. One day, the ground would be solid. The next, a gaping hole of steam would suddenly open up. There were several instances of family cats slipping through the cracks only to be swallowed whole. 
Citizens would pass by deer corpses that got stuck from below the torso. From the pained expressions and outstretched front legs, smoke crawling from their mouths, it looked as if they had tried to climb their way out, but weren't able to escape the abyss. Homes began tilting into the soil as holes opened up underneath their foundations. Not even the dead could escape as corpses were literally dragged down to the abyss when graves started sinking. Despite all this, the citizens of Centralia loved their small community and weren't going anywhere until Valentine's Day, 1981. 12-year-old Todd Domboski was helping his cousin, Eric Wolfgang, fix up an old motorcycle in their grandmother's backyard. Todd noticed steam emanating from the grass and went to investigate, only to be plunged into the earth. Todd was stuck, head below the surface, what felt as hot as the flames of hell, just grazing the tips of his shoe. He tried digging his nails into the earth, desperately clawing his way out, only to fail further. Calling out for Eric, he was trying not to panic. When he was sure he was about to turn into ash, Todd's foot found a root. This gave Eric enough time to find Todd's orange hat among the grass and pull him to safety. What felt like a half hour ordeal for the boy was only one minute. Covered in mud, the boy was rushed to the hospital and was lucky to be alive to tell his tale. And finally, after 20 years of signs of impending doom, the government decided to do something about the Centralia problem. The government implemented a $42 million plan to relocate the locals after selling their homes for a fair market price. Tensions were high. Some neighbors didn't want to leave. The once peaceful town was becoming more and more divided. Joe Moyer, one of the few people who decided to stay till the end, said that people panicked when offered to leave and thought they were being offered a fortune they couldn't refuse. But others were stubborn and steadfast, refusing to let the government put a price on their lives in Centralia. Even the mayor at the time, Lamar Mervyn, refused to leave with his wife. They're not getting it, he said in a later interview. This is the only home I've ever owned, and I want to keep it. But the possibility of developing health problems would make the decision for people like John Lakaitis, whose family decided to leave after his young cousin developed chronic bronchitis from the toxic fumes. Pete Kenanitz lived in Centralia for 70 years, but eventually had a stroke and his wife got too ill. They thought at the time leaving would be the best decision for their family. Those firm on their decision to stay felt betrayed by their former neighbors, and those who rented were suddenly at the verge of homelessness. The homes that many had been living in for decades were now being sold by their landlords, causing the tenants to be forcibly evicted. By August 1983, the town was practically barren. Most of the abandoned homes had been boarded up and marked for demolition, and remaining homes that were occupied needed to be reinforced by structures called brick buttresses to prevent them from sinking into the ground. In 1992, the government of Pennsylvania had to make a tough choice to take control of the last remaining properties. He deemed it too dangerous to live in the fog-ridden city, and the state didn't want to be liable if someone was injured. The home deeds were forcibly taken, and people were displaced. But this didn't deter some proud homeowners. Several families got together to fight against what they believed was an unlawful eviction. The battle went on for three years until it went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, who, not wanting to deal with the legal battle, decided to put the evictions on hold. It wasn't just the unfair evictions that caused a backlash from residents. Many came up with their own theories as to why the government wanted their land. The main theory was that this was all a plot by coal companies to drive them off valuable land. As the years went on, the population only dwindled. By the 90s, full streets were empty after most properties in town had been demolished, and in some cases, replaced with grass almost as if nothing had ever been there. A census in 2000 showed the once bustling coal town had gone from a population of 1,400 to just 21. And as citizens left, so did emergency services. It was up to the remaining residents to come up with their own solutions. Younger citizens volunteered as firefighters and snow shovelers, but for emergencies that could only be resolved by police, they had to rely on services from the next town, 20 minutes away. Over time, it seemed as if the government was trying to erase Centralia completely off the map. When longtime resident John Lakaitis heard they were going to amalgamate Centralia as part of the adjacent city, Ashland, he knew something needed to be done. John alerted the media, who made a spectacle of the ordeal, and the government decided to back off. In the meantime, the post office closed and the United States Postal Service even revoked the town's zip code. 
While Centralia got to keep the town's name, receiving letters and packages became extremely difficult, and residents would either have to set up P.O. boxes in the next town or have mail sent to family members. In 2013, the state ended up taking possession of the remaining homes, but the citizens were allowed to remain. Essentially, they lived tax-free on their land, which would be given up to the state after they passed away. So what the heck was causing all the toxic fumes and sinkholes anyway? Todd Domboski's run-in with Hellfire wasn't too far from the truth. In fact, just underneath the town was a raging subterranean wildfire. It is believed that the fire began in the 1960s when an abandoned mine was used as a garbage dump. The Civil Council decided they wanted to clean up the landfill and the solution they came up with was to, well, set it on fire. Being that fire tends to spread when it's left unchecked, it did just that, eventually igniting an exposed coal vein. What began as a small fire turned into an underground labyrinth of flames, bringing smoke and lethal carbon monoxide to the unsuspecting town above. And as the fire burns through the coal veins underground, it leaves behind empty voids. The land above these voids therefore can become unstable and suddenly collapse, forming the sinkholes. The government initially decided to cover up the fire in 1962, it was estimated that it would cost around $50,000 to put out the raging inferno underneath the town. Adjusted to inflation in 2024, that would cost around $500,000. And the local government was expected to foot half the bill. Officials also didn't know which tunnel was actually fueling the fire, and the cost to close off every tunnel would just be too unreasonable. And by the 1980s, the fire had grown so strong that it would take 20 years of non-stop watering for the fire to go out, according to David DeCock, author of fire underground. The easiest solution seemed to be relocating the residents of the town. Of course, the relocation was at the cost of the unwilling locals, some of whom had lived their whole lives in Centralia, building their homes, raising children, and seeing their grandchildren grow up. Today, the smog crawling over the ghost town of Centralia makes for an eerie feel. As the population dwindled, the town's smoky remains pulled urban explorers, unfortunately at the expense of the remaining population. The popular video game and movie Silent Hill, for example, took inspiration from Centralia's smoky exterior, leading to an influx of nosy tourists. While not all of them mind the intrusion, the majority of locals prefer to be left alone and rightfully so, due to instances of vandalism, harassment, and trespassing. Longtime resident Rita Long even claimed to feel threatened by people entering her yard without permission and approaching her to ask intrusive questions. This was even more exacerbated by the thought of the closest police station being 20 minutes away. Tourists have particularly been interested in what is dubbed Graffiti Highway, a mile-long section of Route 61 that has been covered in graffiti by decades of visitors. People would come from all over to spray paint their names, hashtags, and drawings on the road to make their mark. Unfortunately, even movie studios who expressed interest in using Centralia as a movie set, something that would do wonders to the economy of the ghost town, backed out after seeing the explicit artwork. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the government deemed Graffiti Highway too dangerous and ordered a convoy of 400 dump trucks to bury the area with thousands of tons of dirt. But this hasn't deterred unruly vandals. Nearby grave sites, road signs, and the remaining homes still act as unconsenting canvases for their art. As of 2023, five people are still residing in Centralia. Few buildings other than the homes still stand, the old church continues to be used for services, and former residents still use the cemetery. Centralia today looks like a ghost town, and while the fire has been burning for 62 years now, it's expected to continue to rage for another 200 years. But in the meantime, hope from the remaining citizens that Centralia will persist still burns bright.